I will take my music career on its worst day than doing something I hate on its best day. Yeah. I can't go back to serving tables or doing that. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, it kind of goes back to like whatever it takes to get this. Yes, and that that is the perfect example. I don't think there is anything wrong. And I think a lot of times when I first started making music and I started to make a little bit of money off it, I was like, I'm just going to survive off that. And I'm not going to do anything else because I don't want people to look at me differently if they think that I'm not doing this full time. I think that's the biggest crock of shit ever. All the biggest artists even that I've talked to for the for more than most of their career, even when they were huge, were still doing side jobs and grinding and doing other things to be able to get by. Because at the end of the day, we need money to invest in our music. It costs so much money for beats, equipment. Like I said, if you're not doing this yourself, it costs a lot more. Videos and everything else. And there's nothing wrong with hustling. That's all you are doing. You are hustling to make your dreams come true. And there is nothing wrong with that. And if anyone looks at you differently for that, looks down on you, it's only a reflection of themselves because they don't have the confidence to do something different or take a risk. Welcome to the Mike Squires and Friends podcast. I'm your host, Mike Squires. Today, I'm joined by my good friend, Elijah Kyle. Elijah Kyle is an independent artist from Swansea, Massachusetts, known for his extensive catalog with over 300 songs. Elijah Kyle had accumulated over 15 million Spotify streams and is known for his unique storytelling and ability to deliver in any genre. If you want to support the Mike Squires and Friends podcast, all you got to do is hit that subscribe button or download on your preferred podcast platform. The Mike Squires and Friends podcast is proudly sponsored by DistroKid. Looking to broaden your musical horizons as an artist? Discover DistroKid. With its smooth and rewarding music distribution platform, DistroKid offers unlimited uploads while ensuring artists retain 100% of their royalties and earnings. Join the community of over a million artists who trust DistroKid to distribute their music on major platforms such as Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, TikTok, Tidal, and Instagram. Having personally used DistroKid since 2018, I can attest to its superiority amongst distribution services. Collaborating with fellow artists has become effortless, especially with the ability to easily send splits of songs, streamlining the creative process. With the DistroKid app, accessing these benefits is now more convenient than ever. Safely sign up with two-factor authentication, upload releases on the fly, monitor earnings, and withdraw from your DistroKid bank. Stay updated on royalties through push notifications, effortlessly share hyperfollow links, manage account details seamlessly, and track streaming stats from Spotify and Apple. Additionally, explore Mixia for professional-grade mastering, DistroVid for music video distribution, and Instant Share for secure file sharing with collaborators, producers, and more. The DistroKid app is available on both iOS and Android. Download it today from the App Store or Google Play Store to revolutionize your music career. Visit distrokid.com slash VIP slash Mike Squires to get 30% off your first year membership. Now with that being said, sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of Mike Squires and Friends. Elijah, welcome to the Mike Squires and Friends podcast. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you having me on. I'm super excited to have you here. But the first thing I want to know, dude, is what was it like growing up for Elijah Kyle? Honestly, I can't complain. I had a pretty good I had a pretty good life growing up. You know what I mean? My parents treated me well. I have a great family, a well-connected family, always, always together, and a great group of friends, and nothing but good memories in my hometown. So where is your hometown? Swansea, Massachusetts. I know people probably have never heard of it. Can you tell me what it's like in Swansea, Massachusetts? Everyone knows everyone. Um, you do something, I promise you that. Jenny down, the three blocks, the whole way down across the street, everyone knows about it in five minutes. Super, super close-knit community, which kind of sucks in a way, you know what I mean? Which which made me want to move away from my hometown in the first place, but it has its gifts and its curse, so. Yeah, so what were some of the things you would do in Swansea? Honestly, sports was my whole life. Okay. Outside, outside of music, I from the moment I was... Three years old, as long as I can remember being alive, sports was my whole life, and that's what I thought my career would be. If sports is your whole life, dude, why do you hate the Celtics? Shut the fuck up, bro. I love the Celtics. <laughs> no, I know, I know. But no, I hate what they put me through. <laughs> but think, something that someone might not know about you is you're nice with bowling, dog. Yeah, I got to keep that on the low. You know what I mean? It's but why, no, bring it to the surface, dude. Why are you nice with bowling, dude? Maybe because, I don't know, man. I'm already I'm already a, a white rapper from Swansea, Massachusetts, who's 5'4". I don't need people to know I'm good, like, good at bowling, too. I, I feel like at this point, it's like, But, like, God, how does bro. one get good at bowling, dude? Because, listen, I... For those who don't know, we were shooting a music video for My Hero, yeah, right? Yeah. And I want to talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. But at this bowling alley, Elijah basically picked up a bowling ball, was like, watch this, did the craziest <laughs> spin around, and like the the ball just didn't look like it was going to hit a strike, but then all of a sudden it just curved back in and just took yeah. it home. 
So I grew up probably around. So my grand, both of my grandfathers um, were huge, huge into bowling my whole entire life, and they've been bowling for like fifty years. And around the time I was in, I want to say elementary school, me and my grandfather started a routine that every Tuesday and Thursday. We would go to Dudek Bowling, which is the little pins, not like the the big pins, the 18 that you guys see. And then eventually we started going like five days a week and just became my friggin' life. Was in bowling leagues and state tournaments and everything else Yeah, up until high school. So that's how I got good, just bowling all the time. And my it was just in my family's blood. And what other sports? I know you're into soccer too. Yeah, soccer was my main sport growing up. And then soccer, basketball, tennis, and bowling. Yeah, so how do you think, you know, having this background in sports has applied to your music? I think sports shaped my mentality of just who I am as a person, regardless of music or not, and I think it helped me in terms of being able to weather the storm of, you know, not giving up and pursuing something and building a community and learning how to work with people and network people that necessarily aren't the best people, you know what I mean? Sometimes you you, you give and take with people, if it, you know what I mean? Um and learn to, yeah, build relationships with people. Yeah, what's the music scene looking like in Swansea? Dust. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Me, I don't know. I, so, I maybe know one other kid, but... So how do you end up getting into music? So my mom was in a band. Okay. Growing up, and I think right around the time when I turned two, uh, she stopped touring and stuff. She was in a band that would just play locally and, and travel around, and she had the opportunity to really kind of take it to the next level and basically was was a mom and then didn't have the time to. So I think growing up, music was always in my house, constantly singing, me and my mom. I just remember being in the car singing friggin' Usher's albums and knowing everything by heart, and it kind of inspired me Yeah, so from an early age. Were your parents always supportive of your music career? Yes and no. So I would say... Sorry, mom. I would say my dad more so was at first, just because he, was, he, wanted me, he just wanted me to be happy. And I know my mom did too, 100%. She cares about me so much. But my mom's very realistic, and it's like, if you don't have a plan, you know what I mean? How are you going to make money? What are you going to do in your future? Your insurance, blah, blah, blah. And now looking back at it, I 100% understand because I was a 17-year-old kid who was like, I'm not going to college. I'm going to pursue music. Probably had 10 monthly listeners at the time, and my music sucked. You know what I mean? So from her perspective, I see it. But once I really started to apply myself and get momentum and the music got good, she was she was all in. And she's so supportive now, and I'm both of my parents are, and I'm super appreciative. Yeah, and I think those feelings your mom had came from a place of care. Yeah, exactly, and I feel like you don't realize that until you get older, and I'm like, now I'm like, I totally understand she just wanted the best for my future, and uh, it, yeah, I remember I was watching even a podcast recently that Russ was on, and he was like, my mom gave me a, a, like a certain date, and then was like, if you don't make it by then, you're going to college, and it's like, I understand it, you know what I mean? They want us to succeed. Yeah, So at what point is your mom kind of starting to see like, oh, Elijah's doing this music thing and that she sees it as like a potential career for you? Yeah, I would say probably about maybe a year or two ago. I think for a while, even when I started to gain like a little bit of momentum, I I don't really tell my family. To me, my personality is like, I'm not going to tell them stuff that's going on in music until it means something. Until I can say, hey, mom, I'm buying you a house. Here's your car keys. Boom, boom, boom. It doesn't mean shit to me. Like, I love it, and I love music so much, and I'm grateful for the milestones and the stepping stones along the journey. But in terms of my family and stuff, I kind of keep it on the DL unless it's, like, something that's really cool or, you know what I mean? It's just like, yeah. So what's it look like when you're recording your first song? I am at my buddy Colin Sullivan's house, whose name is Shorty Beats. He um, has a microphone that was probably about $10. I don't even know, USB. It It was terrible. And we're in a closet that I can't even fit in. And I'm under five foot five, you know what I mean? So if I can't fit in this, do the math. It's like Harry Potter, like underneath the freaking, <laughs> underneath the stairs, bro. And we have a blanket, like a blanket over to try to block out the sound. And I just remember dropping my first song and it was so bad. I don't, I can't even say the name of it. it it's, it's kind of an interesting story. You're going to have to say the name. Bad. You, can't, <laughs> you can't come on here and say you can't say the name of it. It, it was just corny, man. Like Say so, it, dog. So you know when that show 13 Reasons came out? 13 Reasons Why. Yeah, 13 yeah. Reasons Why. I liked the show. It inspired me a lot. You know what I mean? I enjoyed the show, I was the show always too. a big advocate of just mental health and you know what I mean? And I had my I had lost my uncle to suicide, so it, it hit me deep, the show. And I ended up making the song, and it was called 13 Reasons. And it was just about, and it was about based on the show. And But the, it was so bad. 
Yeah, dude. It well, just, I don't. It I, was so bad. The song was bad. Yeah. You're saying. <sighs> but I think your message behind it wasn't bad, and like yes. especially going through that like experience with your uncle. Yeah. You know how did that affect you? You know when creating that song. So. It happened when I was super young, you know what okay. I mean? I didn't even know that that was the reason why he passed away. I was just told my whole entire life that he had passed away in a fire because he was a firefighter. Mm. So I never realized that that he had that that, that, that happened. Yeah. So I think once I realized growing up and stuff and just seeing mental health was a big issue in my family with a lot of my family I saw they struggled with, like depression and stuff like that, that it kind of plays a part in your life even if you don't realize it because what's going on around you when you're around like negative energy and stuff and watching that show really connected with me and I guess I didn't really realize why until I got older and you kind of put the pieces together but yeah do you think it like do you want to become like kind of uh, a mental health advocate within your music yeah I think that's something that was a big that really was why I started making music in the first place you know what I mean I was going through some rough times in life and it was great to have music as an outlet and to talk about how I felt when I felt like I could never say that to everyone else because I think a lot of my friends always looked at me as like the strong one or the one that always makes everyone else laugh so like I can't go through anything I was always there for other people and yeah, I think music dude. was my way to kind of talk about how I really felt in life yeah how you know do you know feel I mean? you overcame some of those, t- those tough times music friendships and 100% love. Like, I wouldn't be where I am today without my girlfriend. She's my best friend, my yeah, soulmate. Haley's Not a- to get all soft, but Haley is, like, a one of a kind. As I was, like, doing my research for this, I saw that she was kind of, like, the constant on your feed from, like, day yeah. one. Yeah, I think a lot of things have changed over the course of my life. Friendships and people that I know and music. And no matter what happens, she's always there for me. When I literally said, hey, I'm I'm following my dreams, like— I'm sorry, I'm not the typical, like, I'm going to college and I'm going to be able to support us right away. She was there for me when I had zero dollars. Still have about one cent, but she, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but she loves me and she packed up her bags and moved across the country with me. Yeah, no matter yeah. what I do, she supports. She's all in. She's well, How important do you feel like it is, you know, having a partner that supports you, especially if you're a creative? I think it's so important, dude, because this shit's stressful. You know, I know, like, it's such a mental toll following your dreams, no matter what field it is. And it's just, it's, I'm so lucky and so blessed to have someone to fall back on just to be, when I need a a moment and I'm overwhelmed, just to be like, it's okay. You know what I mean? Sometimes we all need to hear that. And I'm, I'm so incredibly lucky because I overthink so freaking much. I stress about everything, no matter how much that I preach. Numbers don't matter. This doesn't matter. I am the, I obsess because I care so much and it's nice to have someone ground you and be like listen listen fuck face sorry if I can't swear like <laughs> it's okay swear. she probably says worse than that to me like hey <laughs> like it's okay you're gonna be okay yeah so how do you get through those frustrating moments in music um I usually lock the door and don't talk to anyone for about six days <laughs> no no I'm kidding honestly what helps me is sports being with my friends I have to distract myself because I know myself and when I'm if I'm by myself or not doing anything for a little while, I get it. I get in my own head. Yeah. I have to constantly keep moving, keep doing stuff. That's just how my mind works, and it doesn't stop. It's a gift and a curse in terms of inspiration and writing music that I'm always thinking, but my brain doesn't shut off like ever. Like it doesn't, bro. Yeah. What's one of the most frustrating things that have happened within your music career? Ah. <sighs> Oh man, that's that's a good question. I feel like I've had a lot of frustrating things, so I'm not gonna talk about on the podcast. <laughs> well, what's one that comes to mind that you like? You know, had to overcome and was easy to not easy, but like something that you had to like overcome and you know was a challenge. I think just working with people that didn't want to make music anymore. Like I had a few friends mm. that I started making music with like right away. Yeah. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. I'm not and, they, laughing. and they didn't, and they just stopped making music. And I know me and you talk about this all the time about relying on other people. And that's something I wish I learned how to mix and master my own music and yeah. record myself early on. Because I feel like if you do something for eight years straight and you're so used to I'm not doing it, you, yeah. you trap yourself. And if you're an independent artist or an artist in general right now, I'm begging you to take the time, save yourselves the hundreds and thousands of dollars of paying other people and learn how to shoot your videos, yourself, mix and master, be the Russ, fuck everyone else, do it myself. Like, dude, seriously. Like, Well, dude, I'm smiling too right now because we've had this conversation a hundred like times, so many times, dude. It's like <laughs> the truth. And it's just, to me, it's just so funny because it's like, 
sometimes I just feel like we're knocking on the same door over and over yeah. again. But you really can't rely on anyone else in this game. No, because you can't expect anyone else to care about your art the same that you do. No one will. No one's ever going to, you know what I mean? And that was a problem for me too, I felt like, because music... When you're recording with other people, you can't expect them to care as much about your music or creating as you do. Like, I love music at such a high level. I feel like no matter what room I go into, whether it's I'm in the studio or I'm doing a meeting or I'm shooting videos of people, I care so much and I'm like, I'm so into it. And when people don't give that same energy back, I'm like, oh man, I wish I could have just recorded myself for this because I'm like, I love this harmony. Like, let's go. Yeah. And I think it goes down to like, or comes back to like building a team, right? Yeah. Where it's like, and there's certain people, like there are people that you want a part of your team that are like your rock, you know what I mean? That are going to like ride with you and believe in the vision with you. But then I think there are other people that can be a part of your team that like, you know, some people will just work for the dollar you pay them, right? Yeah, and 100%. I think that's also okay. Hey, everyone's got to make their living. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, what's important to you with you know building a team yourself and like people you want to surround around you? So, pretty much everyone who I work with now are people that I've known for a long time. My buddy Kyle and Sam Jarden shoot most of my videos. Obviously, I have you shoot my videos. You're one of my best friends. Haley shoots my videos. With who I record with, I cannot record with anyone who I don't genuinely love as a person. I find it so tough to separate. So a lot of people find it tough to separate like the business from friendships, and I get that. But for me, I need to work with people who I genuinely respect and love as a person, and I know that I can hang out with outside of music. Because to me, that, that's what makes the best music, when you form bonds and the connections that are made, you know what I mean, in terms of collaborations and stuff. And the vibe in the studio is so important. It's everything. You, you can't have a bad vibe. Like, A bad vibe in the studio will ruin the whole session. I've been in studio sessions where, like, I was talking to the engineer, and I was just like, bro, like, thank you so much. I'm loving this, man. This is great. And he's like, yeah, this isn't really my type of music, but, like, cool. He's (laughs) like, you're just really a client, but I'm like, wow. Yeah, (laughs) like, fuck. At least least pretend to care. Yeah, at least fucking vibe, bro. Like, I'm paying you $100 an hour, dog. (laughs) Yeah, just, like, pretend to care. Dude, so at what point are you starting to see success in your music career? So... I'll, it's it's funny because we see this all the time where success on the internet sometimes doesn't translate to plays. Yeah. Because it's crazy to me that the first the first thing I ever posted, which was on Twitter, blew up. Like, I'm talking like 600,000 views. Insane, dude. Like, it haven't probably hit that since, which is crazy. And I remember I started to do these every Tuesday. I would do weekly car bars. And that really started to, like, gain momentum on Twitter and social media and stuff. And I started to drop consistently on Spotify. I want to say this is like 2021. And I started to finally get some momentum. I had worked with a few bigger artists like Justin Stone. I reached out. And I really started to kind of establish myself as an artist, not just someone who raps in the car. You know what I mean? I started to focus on making good music and singing and putting a product together that was somewhat actually listenable to. Yeah. So that's probably about 2021. But But you'd been dropping music before that because I know one of the first things you dropped was Evolution. Yeah. So can we talk shout about- out, shout out to my buddy Johnny. Um, he did that song with me. So he's one of the reasons that I even got into music in terms of creating. Two people are very, very responsible for me making my first song. So one is him, and one is my buddy Tommy, who was a teacher that I had for like eight years. Um, and we were, we were friends. We had mutual friends too. And I he shot my first video ever, and I showed him a song, and I was like, hey man. Like, let me know what you think about this. And he was like, I believe in you. Like, you genuinely have so much talent. I'm going to shoot a video for you. Let's get this done. Like, just just put your art out into the world. Like, what do you have to lose? And we had always bonded over music. And during class, he was a video teacher at the school. Yeah. And his friend was Johnny. Um, and he was an artist at the time. He had been around the world, like L.A. and back, and went through the whole grinding process of what it's like trying to make it in Hollywood. And he had kind of just taught me a little bit of the ways around the industry. And he hit me up. It was like, we need to make a song together. And we did. And that's that's how it came out. Also with my buddy Colin. We recorded that in the closet. Yeah. So what, <laughs> what was the response to that first song? Around the school? You know, I, it was 50-50. Like, all the kids in my grade were like, this is crazy. Because that was my senior year of high school. And around the school, they were like, holy shit, that's crazy. And then you had, like, the other grade above me was just like, bro, like, you're trash. Like, you're terrible. Like, never make music again. So it was, it was like a weird dynamic at the time. Yeah. I think a lot of people... I, were, Dude, I think there's a lot of value in being a polarizing artist. You know what I mean? You look yeah. at some of the greats where it's like Eminem. There are people that love Eminem. Yeah. There are people that hate Eminem. Sometimes I wish I was more polarizing, dude. Dog, because, if people if people hate you, that means you're doing something right. Well, I honestly, it's this is going to sound weird, but like 
I enjoy hate to some capacity. Me too. But it, kinda, so, it kinda turns me on in a way. Well, I wasn't gonna go there. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, oh. How so? <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, but what it's I was good motivation, man. I, okay. Well, that, it's just like I find it like funny, but I actually just address hate with a lot of positivity, like always. You know what I mean? Like I'll come <laughs> at it w- with the nicest, like, sorry you yeah. feel that way, man. You like, have the best response as po- response possible. Like what you posted on your Instagram story yesterday. Like that's exactly how I wish I reacted when I was young because I'm still young, obviously. But when I first started making music, that like that shit got to me. I was just like, bro, f- like why is this person hating on me? Like this makes no sense. And now I'm just like. I could give a fuck less what you think about me. Well, hate is just part of the game. And yeah, like, bro. If, you, if you're someone who's listening to this and you're getting into music, like, just, you got to have tough skin a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and I think a lot of times, like, if you let that shit get to you, I know I've never experienced it at, like, an extreme level of someone to the extent that's super, super famous. So we don't, I don't yeah. truly know what that's like every day waking up and seeing that much. But just in general, bro, like, I love myself. You know what I mean? I know what I'm capable of and I believe in my art and and my craft that I could be in any room with anyone at any given time and hold my own. And what is some, what is freaking Joey 3.0 with a, a blank face Instagram picture who's yeah. probably a fucking inbred gonna, gonna tell me about my music. You know what I mean? Tell me that I'm trash. Yeah, dude. Screw him, bro. Yeah, so I don't know. Haters are gonna hate. <laughs> Haters are gonna hate, dog. Um, I wanna talk to you. So moving a little bit down the timeline after Evolution, you dropped Soul. Yeah. So can we talk about Soul? I feel like that was an upgrade for me. I had actually the person who I had mixed that song was at the time Post Malone's uh, engineer. Okay, he that's mixed crazy. a lot. Who of, is it? I, f- I think it was like JB Turn Me Up. I think his name was. Oh, he that's had, really He far. had produced like Post's whole like first mixtape and stuff, and I know they were really close. And I think he, pro- yeah, I think he mixed Congratulations. I know and this is like around 2018. You worked on that song. Yeah. Okay. So I had, which is funny because this this is actually a funny story. So he had hit me up, and obviously I don't know anything about communication in terms of the the music business or how how, like, paying for engineering works and what's the timeline of when you're getting it back. And I just remember, like, texting this guy, like, like 50 times. Like, hey, bro, like, it's been a few days. Like, where's where's the song? Like, can I have my song? And I probably gave the dude 20 bucks. He was just being nice on Twitter. And he's mm-hmm. like, dog, like, I'm making an album with Post Malone. Like, can you stop fucking hitting me up? <laughs> and I didn't even know who Post Malone was at the time. You know what I mean? He had just, he was not really, not even any, White Iverson didn't even drop yet. It was, like, yeah. right around that time. And then he could probably elevated the song to the next level with the mix. Yeah, well, that's the thing, too, where it's like, you know, with music, you kind of have to know how to move and, like, how to act in this industry, and that's important. Yeah. What's something that you've learned from that? You know what I mean? Just like, or what's a mistake that you made or something that you were like, oh, in this moment, I, oh, I shouldn't have handled this like this. I should have done it differently. Just, like, jumping the gun on, like, certain relationships. You know what I mean? Like, I went to the phases of DMing, DMing everyone my songs and just being that annoying person that we look back now and you're like, bro, can you leave me alone? But, like, I remember a few artists had reached out to me that I, I really looked up to and just hitting them back a bunch of times or, like, treating it as if, as if they, I was, like, a fanboy instead of just being like, thank you, man, I appreciate you, like, respecting my work. And being more business-oriented from the upfront and then and then building that relationship with them over the time yeah. instead of just being, like, a little like a little bitch fanboy. Like, mm. you know what I mean? And coming yeah. off, like that energy pushing people away like this kid don't even you know what I mean he ain't taking this serious yeah well I know early on in your career it's probably in like 2019 Logic tweeted you yeah yeah that was my first like m- big moment I would say at the, and Logic was pop he's still popping now but that was like peak Logic like he was at the Grammys that year you know what I mean like going off because he was coming off that huge song, the 1 800 song. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was like a big time. And I remember I was in Not Your Average Joe's that closed down in my hometown. Man, that shit smacked. I love that bread. But I was with my buddy Ben. And the next minute, my phone is just going off. Like, and I had, I didn't really get that many notifications at the time. So I had my notifications on. And I just see Twitter, Twitter, boom, 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 like thousands. And it was that logic tweeted at me that he was fire. And then he messaged me on Instagram and was like, I see you. Like, keep grinding. Like, was he and, one of the people you hit up a million times? No. <laughs> okay. I was just like, thank you so much, man. I, I let that be. But that was like a moment that was surreal. And I remember all the school tweeting about it like, oh, my God, logic. What school were you in at the time? Uh, I think I that was right when I graduated. Graduated high school? Yeah, I think that was either. So you were the, hella young, dude. Yeah, yeah. I was. I think I was like 19 at the time. Oh, that's crazy, And that dude. happened. So what's the school acting like? That You know what I mean? Are you like, no one can talk to me this week because logic tweeted you? <laughs> Honestly? <laughs> 
as a 19 year old baby, you know? <laughs> Honestly, after that happened, it became the joke that I was like logic. Like kids like around my hometown would be tweeting out like, oh my God, I saw logic at- Swansea at logic, Swan dude. Yeah, exactly. They'd be like, I saw logic at Target. Like just f fucking with me. It is what it is, bro. Like people, you know how it goes. People don't support you until everyone does. And now I can't tell you how many of those same kids hit me up now. And they're like, congratulations, bro. I'm so glad you stuck with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Fuck them. Fuck them. But I, I still like, you know, I'll have people, dude, I, I've had people from my past that like used to like, not like bully me, but like. Yeah. I never experienced never, that. But I never, I never really got bullied like that either. But I had, I had my fair share of haters, dog. Like in high school, well, you know, cause I was like a young kid in all my tech classes. Yeah, I was you with, started making videos so young, bro. Dude, I was, yeah, I was, I started so early. I mean. By the time I was like a junior in high school, I was already filming like shows with like Big Sean, right? Yeah. So man's I, a goat. But fucking goat. We don't need. I don't want to gas me up. Give here. his flowers, okay? No, 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 chill, chill, chill. I'm trying. The point I'm trying to get to is like, bro. I just remember about you know that time in my life. I had so many haters. Like those yeah. kids hated me, dude. And you, you know, know how it goes, though, bro. They were probably in high school going through shit, and they just didn't want to see anyone win. Like, yeah, but you know, I've had a lot of them like surface back up and like show love and. At no point do I, like, I've never held it, like, against them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I just didn't care that much, you know? Because, like, no one's going to see your vision. Until, of course. Yeah. No. And I think, well, like, when I was in high school and stuff, that shit would get to me at the time because, you know what I mean? It's just, like, it's new to the territory. You're not used to it. But as the older I get, I'm like, it doesn't mean anything. And I don't hold any ill will against anyone, dude. And, like, regardless. And I'm like, if they hit me up today, I'm like, thank you, man. I appreciate it. I don't even think about the past of anyone who hated on me. I'm like, dude. You were probably going through shit. It wasn't anything to do with me. It was only the stuff that had to do with you. Like, I hope you're doing better. Like, much love. I think the music industry, too, is just one of the most humbling industries, dude. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah. in the sense where, you know, especially if you're an artist on the rise, where, you know, you might post a song, you think it's the one, and maybe it just doesn't yeah, do what you it's, expect. It's always the ones you think that are going to go, and then it's the one you didn't think that, that ends up going, bro. Yeah, and I know what you're saying. It's humbling because I feel like the music industry changes we're, we're always getting screwed over and having to adapt and find a way to survive as independent artists. And the climate of music has changed so much with content and stuff. You know what I mean? It's just, you got to keep going. There are some shady characters in music. Have you ever had a time that you got screwed over? Yeah, plenty of times. Can we talk about a time? You don't have to name names. Uh... Uh. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> you just keep trying to poke the van, don't no, you? No, it's a fair question. Dude, I've had many times where I screwed up. Like, I'll bring one up, dude. I used to have a manager character that, you know, I brought into my circle. Yeah. And, and then he started, like, working with other artists around in my circle. And then he created bad vibes with me, right? Yeah. And, like, I had, like, PayPal's from him bouncing and things like that. Like, things weren't adding up. So, you know, I tried, like... So then at the time, he's working with other people in my circle, right? Yeah. So I'm, like, trying to give my homies a heads up, like, yo, this dude's not who we think he is. Like, yeah. my PayPal's from him are bouncing. Like, it's not like yeah. – but everyone's like, yo, he promised me this, 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 and this. Like, you know what I mean? So everyone thought he was, like, the GOAT. Yeah, and he was really fucking you over. Well, he fucked me, and then he ended up fucking everybody, dude. Yeah. Like, just because – like, and I, I, it was weird at the time because, like, I gave everyone a heads up. But then at the time, I didn't, like, who's to say that he wouldn't come through for them? You know what I mean? So I yeah. was like, let me not, like, if he does something for them, that's great. You know what I mean? But I gave him a heads up. I'm like, yo, he dropped the ball heavy for me here so that when it came time to, uh, I just kind of let that train run and operate. You know what I mean? Like, I had yeah. to, like, sit back and just watch that one crumble from a distance. I feel like there's so many things that have happened to me, and a lot of them, like, I just try to block out of my memory because I just, like, you try to move on and stuff. I've just had, like, so many people, like, steal from me and freaking so many other shit that happened, but, like... Like, steal melodies, steal money? Yeah, melodies. I actually had a, this guy, like, completely was stealing my songs. Like, like uh, I want to talk about the situation, Mike. But I don't want to stir up You the don't pot. need to say any names, dude. Yeah. Well, I think the worst situation I had with was a few years ago with a kid who I was friends with for a long time. And basically, I would do a lot of work. I would always do everything possible for him, whether it was write songs or do other stuff and try to help this kid out in every way possible. And I flew home from Ohio strictly just to record with this kid because I was, fifth, I was with him. I'm like, we're in this together. Like, let's do this. And then as soon as we created a bunch of music together and stuff, he pretty much like cut me off, and it was and it was the end. And I learned fast, even from not from that situation, but other situations that like people only want something out of you for the most part, 
and it sucks and it, it made me move differently. It made me be a lot more business oriented, which is sad that it, like something like that happens and it makes you be more upfront with people. Like, hey, like I used to be always like if I was doing a feature, like no problem, bro. If it takes you three weeks to send the money in, that's fine. But like, you know, I mean, it changes your mindset to be like, this is this is what it has to be. Unless you're with people who you truly bond with over a long period of time. I just, I have trust issues in terms of pe- because of people in the music industry. Yeah, people some- not giving me percentages for songs and not realizing it, you know what I mean? Screwing me over in that department. People that you look up to. Yeah, I mean like, how do you bounce back from situations like that? You know, because moments like that could be so discouraging. You probably feel hella yeah. hurt in those moments too. So well, what, you, ma- what keeps you, you going? You hear the stories, you know what I mean? Everyone tells you when you come into the music industry. All people tell me was like, this industry is cutthroat, blah, blah, blah. And I think it was different for me because I worked with so many people who I thought were really close friends to me. And I'm grateful so much for Colin, who's Shorty Beats, because he was the first person I recorded with. And even though he stopped making music, his own personal decision... Me and him have such good blood, and you know, I mean, he's one of my best friends still to this day, and he never, ever would do anything to fuck me over, unlike other people. Yeah, dude. I mean, it's tricky, too. Like, the industry, and the thing is, you know, the perception of the music industry from outside the music industry, I think, is so different than what it yeah, actually people, is. Yeah, Because people, like, anybody who's not in music is so sussed out by music. It's got, like, yeah. this weird... but feeling you know what to I mean? flip a coin though like at the same time music has gained me so many friendships that i'll have forever mm. even like you know what i mean you're one of my best friends freaking i moved to ohio because of my two one of my two closest friends matt and jonah those and like so many relationships and friendships that all we, the people that i we text have, are music all the people we yeah. have yeah i talk to more people in mute through music i feel like truly because of music i could go any place in the world and i know you feel the same from egypt to freaking anywhere and have a place to stay. And some friend would be like, hey, bro, like, I got you if you needed anything. Like, I've built so many true friendships. Did you get any advice from somebody within music that you carry with you? I mean, I've definitely I've definitely gotten a lot. Um, anything that comes to mind? Honestly, one of the first things that comes to mind is my buddy Johnny. Okay, what do you say? And he would just, he really just explained to me the how, it's stupid, but just to keep going. Like, literally, like, the journey, it is a journey. And to not worry about, like, the end result and to stay in the present and focus on, like, what's going on right now. Because it's so easy to think about, I'm not I'm not where I want to be, but you miss all the little steps. You know what I mean? I, I think about even today, like, damn it, my, my Spotify went down. Why aren't I where I want to be? But five, five years ago, I'd be shitting myself if I knew that I had 200,000 monthly listeners or something. You need to appreciate, he, this is what he would always say to me, a quote. You need to learn how to appreciate the small wins. And I think that is so, so important because for me, like, I became numb. You become numb to, like, accomplishing anything. You're like, you hit something and you're like, damn, this this doesn't feel, I don't feel like the happiness because I'm I, I'm not where I want to be yet. But even though I just passed this this mark, like, why don't I why don't I feel happy yet? Because it's an endless search. If you just keep, keep going and going and never, you're never satisfied. You always want more. So you need to just, like, relax celebrate celebrate the small wins and just enjoy the journey and the life and what it brings you in the process and the people you meet and the friendships and everything that comes with it. And the small wins will add up to the big wins. Yeah, dude, and that's that's been the story of my whole career. You know what I mean? I've never had the big viral moment. I've never had the TikTok go crazy. I've Some people have a TikTok get 10 million views. I've probably had like 10 million TikToks get 10,000 views. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm a, I've just learned to accept that it's going to happen when it's meant to. And all I can do is just keep keep trying new things, keep making the best music possible, and being myself. I think that's what's gotten me this far is just being myself. What made you realize music's for you? Oh, man, I honestly, I, I locked myself into the mindset of this is what I love. I need to find a way to make money off it and to support my family, and I'm not giving myself any option of anything else. I know people believe in the backup plans, and but I've I've shut that out of my mind, and I'm just too driven for the love that I have for this, and I just believe in myself that much that I will make this happen. I don't believe in the backup plan either because I, if you I, if you have a backup it opens, plan, yeah, no, it's one foot in, one foot out, and that, no. you know what I mean. Music is something you yeah. just got to be in, or you're it's not. It's a hill that I'm just die. I'm willing to die on, and it is what it is. If it takes me until I'm 65 years old, and I'm in in a wheelchair, and I'm still dropping freestyles, but I pop, then it is what it is. But I just I can't stop now. I've made it too far, and I believe in myself way too much to give up on my dreams and the things that I want in life. Where do you see yourself in five years? In five years? Do you want the humble answer, or do you want the, I want the, the real answer. answer? 
I truly see myself being one of the, whether it's independent or not, one of the biggest artists in the world. Let's um, go, dude. I really do. I don't, I think age is just a number now. One thing that has like stressed me out recently is that I remember just being that 17 year old kid at a high school and they're like, damn, like that's crazy. You're so young. And like, I'm like, oh shit, I'm 24 now. Time's creeping up. But I, I stopped looking at it like that, man. You can't, you can't live your life like that. I'm, I'm freaking in the middle of my twenties. Like Eminem didn't blow up until he was 30. You know what I mean? Like shit's going to happen when it's meant to. Every day is a chance to reach new fans, to reach new people, to inspire and uplift and be the best version of yourself every day. I see a lot of people get caught up on age and I understand yeah. why because, you know, most people think music is a young man's sport and to some degree it can be. I think the landscape has changed so much though with, with like socials and just... Wow, I was going to bring up something real quick because, you know, Jelly Roll, like the homie yeah, Jelly exactly. Roll. I mean, homie I think is 38 now and yeah. he's having... The, the biggest best. moment yeah. of his life, dude. Yeah. So, like, even just from that aspect, he's got me, like, so I'm 28 now. So, in my head, yeah. I'm like, yo, I have 10 years to, like. Which is crazy. We're I mean? so like, young, bro. Like, you but know? even if we're not, like, I like exactly, he's a story that it's, it's perfect. The dude's freaking winning Grammys now. Like, this, every single person's journey is different. It doesn't, you know what I mean? No one is going to be on a straight course. And a lot of times, I think what's tough about music is that you start to gain that momentum. And at least for me. Something happens, you drop. You know what I mean? It's not a straight line of up. It, it's you're down. You go you five steps forward, six steps back. But it's about who keeps going, and you eventually, shit's gonna happen. It's a roller coaster. Dude. I just think about how many people truly gave up, and the next day something would have. It was their moment, and it's just forgotten. I can't. I can't live like that. It's I like can't literally live the regret. meme. Have you ever seen the meme of like the miner, and he had like one more hit, <laughs> and then he was gonna get to all the diamonds. Oh, it's it's fr it frustrates me, bro. Even just seeing like people waste their talent like that, I can't I can't live like that, knowing that I had I had like the chance to change the world or do something with the talent that I have and just put it to waste. I can't. Yeah, what would you say to people that you know are thinking or maybe that are in music and thinking about quitting? I would say, well, first off, I think it's also like a mindset thing. You know what I mean? I, I do believe that not everyone has the mindset to be cut out for this industry. That's just my, like, true, honest opinion. Like, you have to be different. You know what I mean? And there are a select few that are truly different breeds, that Mamba mentality, like you, like other people I know that can keep going through all of the obstacles. I believe we all have the power to, but you really need to dig deep and to really adjust. I, I, adjusting. Because for me, for instance, content... I posted the same videos about 200 times in a row and none of them did good. And for so long, I was stubborn. You need to look yourself in the mirror and be like, why aren't I reaching my goals? Is it, is it the music? Is it because of the mastering? Is it because of, you know what I mean? You need to be willing to look yourself in the mirror and be like, there's a reason why I'm not where I'm at yet. How can I get there? Mm, like, and if, re, like kind of uh, reverse engineer yourself. Yeah, you need to look like within yourself and be honest and be like, I understand my friends are hyping me up every time I send them a song, but like, why and I want, why I'm where I want to be. And a lot, most of the time it is because the music isn't good enough. Like I look at back at all the songs that I thought were going to pop and I'm like, this isn't good enough yet. I finally feel like now, like eight years into making music that I'm finally releasing stuff that I think has more mass appeal. You know what I mean? And I probably just wandered on and off, but you know, it's, it's a tough freaking journey, bro. <laughs> yeah. And I think you said something interesting where it's like, this game's not for everyone. It's not. And I realized that. And, and it, and the thing is, it's like a very tough journey. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. especially kind of going back to the beginning of this, very mentally taxing. Yeah, it's it's the most stressful job in the world, I feel like, one of them. Well, it's because you just don't know what the next play is, right? No, you are just hoping. Yeah, and I. it's also a stressful job in terms of, of planning. I think, even my mom said to me the other day, she's like, you know, the older you get, the more time flies by. And I said to her back, I was like, that scares me to think about because time goes by so fast now since I started making music because you're constantly planning for the next drop. Like, you know what I mean? Your head's down making your 50 States project right now. You're going to look and the year's going to be done. Oh, and it's like, you know what I mean? I'm like, year. how are we already got, about to be in April? And I'm, I'm like, I'm planning my next drops. And then they come up and you're like, slow down. You know what I mean? Life, life flies by. And that's one of the reasons why I work so freaking hard and I know... We just want to make shit happen now because you never know when today, like it's going to be your last day. And I just, I, one of my biggest fears is not living up to what I know I have inside of me and bringing the ideas in my head to life while I'm still here. 
Yeah, the time flying by thing is a scary thing, though, too. Yeah. That's part of the reason why I chilled out with touring a little bit. Yeah. Because, you know, I'd go on these tours, and in 2018, I was on the road for, like, 10 months, dog. That's crazy. It, which is insane, but, like, you know, you're away for so long, like, things are different when you get back. Even yeah. in a 10-month period, it's yeah. like— I can imagine, bro. That's crazy. Yeah, and I was touring so much, you know, where it's like I'd lost touch with so many friends because I was on the road so yeah. much. Because by the time I'm back home, I'm just like— Bro, 10 months go by, we— Two weeks go by and things can change. Yeah, it's that's crazy because this is like the first year that I've ever had that little experience. You know, I played like two or three shows. We went on a little tour with Dylan Reese and uh, Adam and Adam Yoakum, and I was beat. Like all we did was play a Boston show, and then the next day we drove to Pittsburgh. And I've I've never had that really. That's the one thing that I'm really trying to approach this year is to start to tour more and stuff. And I never had that experience. And I'm like, bro, I just drove ten hours. I got to wake up and do the same thing tomorrow. Like, I'm beat. My voice is sore. And I'm like, I can't imagine. Like, I give so much props to, like, Webby and Echo and all these people in the circle that I see going on these three-month tours and, and every day what you put your voice through. Like, people don't understand how mentally draining it is, and then people want to talk to you after. And it's like, I'm fried. <laughs> like, I, it was two days, and I was fried. It took me, like, a week to recover. It's kind of like working out, though. You know what I mean? Like, the first day you're back in the gym— you're clearly sore. Yeah. And you're just like, I need to. Yeah. Drink. And it's like, but, I got to do this again in the next. But the thing is, eventually when you start working out and you're constantly in yeah. it. Yeah. You're not sore anymore. That's what I figure. You get into a routine and it becomes more second nature. Yeah. And that's like, you know, because, as dude, I've toured so much where yeah. it's like, you kind of just like embrace it at that point because you have no other option. Because if you do anything to fight the flow. Yeah. You're going to cook yourself. That was the. Two of the best days of my life, though. I've Can we talk about those yeah, days? Yeah, dude. I've played a lot. Of, like I said, I've played a lot of sports. I've scored a lot of goals. And nothing matched the feeling of being on stage. Like, that was the first time I've ever had, like, 100 people sing my chorus back to me. And it gave me chills. It was it was the best It was the best feeling I've ever had in my life. I had Adam and uh, Dylan on the pod literally the day in between yeah. those shows. And yeah. they said that the shows were really good. Dude, it was just so freaking awesome. And I didn't, I didn't know what to expect. You know what I mean? I... The ticket sales weren't weren't that high in Boston, and then uh, so many people showed up at the door, and a lot of people that I didn't even know that drove 15, 15 hours to the show. I'm like, like, tell me my music has saved their lives, and I'm like, it was just, I was blown away. I don't even have words. It, it, made, it just made me appreciative of, and another reason why to never give up on what I do, just to because no, there's nothing better than inspiring others and, and hearing that the music helps people and I think that's so freaking dope to be able to meet these people and talk to them in person and just really see it it's different online you know what I mean of course it, it means so much when someone DMs you but having that interaction face to face and being able to see like the lives that you've impacted is, is fucking incredible yeah dude and like the thing is I have a fear of like letting people down a little Me too. bit Big. where you know I think about like where I just have to keep going because you know if I was to quit it's like, dang, like, think. I just think of all the people that I'm like, one, anybody who believed in me ever, know. you know, know what I mean? Letting them down. I know. Uh, I'm in the middle of this 50 States project, letting down all the other artists who are yeah. part of it. Like, yeah. so, you know, certain things you just got to push through and keep going. And, and like, that's why we talk about it's so important to have, like, people. I think it is important to have people that believe in you. Like, I hear sometimes people are like, it, like, even when I say it doesn't matter, no matter what, I'm going to keep going. Like, there's a reason that helps me do that. And that's because I've had friends. Out, even outside of Haley, like my two best, two of my best friends have been there for me since I dropped my first car bar videos. Helped me film it. My buddy Jake and my buddy Mac. They buy every single they they buy every single one of my merch drops. They never say like, "Hey, bro, I'm your friend. Can I have can I have this for free?" You know what I mean? I've had people that have really been there for me throughout my whole entire journey that have been like, "Bro, I'm so proud of you to see how much you've improved." And that shit that shit keeps you going when you have people like that in your circle that truly believe in you that can light the fire under your ass when you're like down bad you know what i mean yeah and i think like you were saying too the little wins to yeah. you know really get you through it and i know a win that you took was that you know lost in the mountains was 72 on the itunes charts yeah that when that happened i was like you don't realize that it's only itunes and this is me probably like looking at it differently now but like at the time, I'm like, holy shit, I'm seeing my name next to, like, a, a 1997 Outcast album. Like, this is crazy. But yeah, you know what it, I mean? It kind of just shows you that your dreams are possible. And yeah. And someone's tuning in in order for it to yeah, even get like up someone a little bit. Like, people are starting to really believe in you. Like, you see you see the, the movement start to happen, and people started putting EK fam in their bio. And I'm seeing people tattooing my lyrics on them, and I'm like, this, this shit's getting real. Like, I need to really, like, I really need to hone in. Like, this has to happen. I need to make this happen. 
I'm very big into believing in yourself. You know yeah. what I mean? Because you have to believe in yourself before anybody else will. Because yeah. how are you going to convince anybody else that your shit is great when you don't think your shit is yeah. great? You know, what do you have to say about believing in yourself? It's everything. Manifestation, believing in yourself. If you can't if you can't close your eyes and picture yourself on that stage winning the Grammy or whatever your whatever your main goal is or in life, if you want that house and you can't picture yourself a way to get there, it's not gonna happen. You need to be the you need to believe in yourself when all else fails, you have to have your own back. When people fuck you over in this industry, when tours go wrong, like when when mics shut off when you're on stage, you need to be able to just be like, let go and just be yourself. And just keep going. Just keep freaking going. Head down in the sand. Keep going. You know, and things are bound to go wrong if you have a career in music, right? Yeah. It's just part of the game. In life. (laughs) In life, dude. Things are bound to go wrong. You know what I mean? But to me, it's like, I'd much rather, listen. It's how you react. it, It is how you react. But to me, I'm also like, I will take my music career on its worst day than doing something I hate on its best day. Yeah. I can't go back to serving tables or doing that shit, bro. I, it's rough. I mean, you even know, like, I've door dashed. I door dashed for a wicked long time just to survive. I don't really do it anymore, but, like, that shit is stressful, and I don't want to do that shit ever again. <laughs> but I want to talk to you a little bit about that, too, because, you know, it kind of goes back to, like, whatever it takes to get this. Yes, and that that is the perfect example. I don't think there is anything wrong, and I think a lot of times when I first started making music and I started to make a little bit of money off it, I was like, I'm just going to survive off that and I'm not going to do anything else because I don't want people to look at me differently if they think that I'm not doing this full time. I think that's the biggest crock of shit ever. All the biggest artists even that I've talked to for the for more than most of their career, even when they were huge, were still doing side jobs and grinding and doing other things to be able to get by because at the end of the day, we need money to invest in our music. It costs so much money for beats, equipment. Like I said, if you're not doing this yourself, it costs a lot more videos and everything else and there's nothing wrong with hustling that's all you are doing you are hustling to make your dreams come true and there is nothing wrong with that and if anyone looks at you differently for that looks down on you it's only a reflection of themselves because they don't have the confidence to do something different or take a risk yeah and you're either gonna have to have a little chunk of change or put in the sweat equity to make your career happen yeah for me dude I got like I got in the game early doing a lot of video stuff. Exactly. But for the first however long of my career, my music career thankfully like is in a place where it's profitable, it's making money yeah. now. But my film career funded my music career. You yeah. know what I mean? And let you do the different avenues like things that you wanted to do that made you happy. Yeah, so I what I want to just go into that is like find what works for you to make your dreams happen yeah. because it doesn't need to be this clean cookie cutter no. like I'm no. just doing this now because you also don't want to put yourself in a poor financial position. No, yeah, you want to be able to survive. Like, it got to the point where it's like, okay, do I want to just get by off music and not be able to travel or do the things that are going to get me inspiration? That's a huge other thing, too. Like, I get, like, it's fun having a few songs that are like, I was broke. Now, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, sleeping on a, on a sofa. But it's like, like, Living is the best inspiration. Yeah, that people you've lived ask a lot. Me, you travel a lot. Yeah, people ask me, like, how, how are you always inspired? I'm like, every single moment you're alive, there's some inspiration around you, whether it's bad energy or good energy. Like, there's always a reason to be inspired with what surrounds you. Yeah. And you have the ability to, to travel and see the world and gain new perspectives and new cultures and keep diving in. What are some of the places you travel to? Because I know you traveled a lot within the last couple of years. Yeah, too. a lot like obviously like in the United States. And now to paraphrase from when I was young until like five to I don't even know, like 20, I said, I'm never going on a plane. That's crazy. Like, I went on one plane when I was young to Florida and I was like, my family didn't go on a lot of family vacations. That wasn't really our thing. I was just on to the next sports game. And then when I got started making music and started connecting with people, in Texas and in Colorado and all around, all around the United States, I really started to just travel. And I never thought that I would ever be on a plane ride by myself. Like, I just remember packing my bags, buying a ticket, going to Texas, making a trip, going down to Ohio and all around the United States. And then eventually I went to Ireland and France. And this year I'm going to Italy. And I'm just trying to see every freaking place in this whole entire world. Probably except Russia. I don't really... Putin. I don't, I don't know about that one. But, like, besides that, bro, I'm trying to go everywhere. Yeah, you brought up Colorado, too. Freaking love Colorado, But bro. I want to talk to you about our boy in Colorado, Atlas, and movie scenes. The GOAT! So how did that record come to be? The and GOAT, so... I know I produced it. Yes, so you know what I mean? yes, like, you produced it. But, so, around the time where, like, the YouTube... What, 
uh, so Crypt in the YouTube scene, he was a huge, he still is huge, YouTuber, rapper, artist. He had um, invited a bunch of artists over his house and did a cookout cipher and would do always do these huge ciphers that were going crazy on YouTube, and it brought a lot of like the community together. And at, oh, that, that's really dope. And at that time, Atlas was working with him, Chase, and a few other people a lot, and, and Luke. And I had talked to him a few times. He was smaller than me at the time, and I was just like, I was... I had dropped an album, a uh, collab album with King Blitz called Written in Stone. And he had messaged me and was like, bro, like super fire project. I love it. Keep doing your thing. And I was like, thank you, man. Like your voice is incredible. I saw your covers. I would love to work someday. And we had talked a few times after that, just like, yeah, man, send me something, blah, blah, blah. And nothing ever happened. And then like, you're a fucking bitch blows up. He's huge. Everyone knows him. He's a freaking star now. And a few times in between that, I would just hit him up and be like, bro, like I'm so happy for you. I'm great. I'm like, it's awesome to see, like, how hard you worked. And I remember you talking about working 100 hours a week just to get, like, pay the bills for your family and survive and still making music. And I had had a few beats that I was going to send him, and I was like, this doesn't feel right. And I'm like, I know if I want that big production, that masterpiece, I got to go to my boy Mikey Squires, baby. I hit up the GOAT. And I was like, Mike, I know you've made songs with Atlas before. We got to send him a smash. I got this idea of a concept, and we got to fucking kill this shit. And we sent it to him, and he was like, "Yo, like this is fire. Like I'm gonna, I know that you're not one of those that is hitting me up because I got big. Like we have been talking for five years, and you always thought I was great. I've always believed in your music, and I'm, I'm proud of you for keep going. And it was just a mutual respect, you know what I mean? That we built over time. That even though we didn't talk a lot, it was always like you could tell it was real love. It wasn't like I want to be friends with you because you're big. It was like I truly believe you are a fucking once in a lifetime generation voice because he is, and." The song came out great, and you killed it. And Thank I, you, it dude. wouldn't have happened without you. You were the final. You were the final puzzle piece that made it happen. Dude, well, dude, I met Atlas through Cakes, Cakes Mitchell, because he put Ryan. Kate, that's Ryan is Cakes, the same yes. person. Yes. Uh, so Ryan uh, posted Atlas on his story, and I was like, "Yo, who is this?" Because I had the song yeah. "Take Me Home" that I wrote that I was like looking for. Voice, I actually sent it to my boy Grizzly Adams, and he was like, "Yo, like I don't really perform things that I don't write." Like, yeah. It was, I was like, dang it, dude. Like, so who am I going to find, like, who has this, like, sonic voice? Yeah, powerhouse. And I, yeah, and then, you know, I stumble upon Atlas, and uh, he doesn't have, like, a huge following on YouTube yet. But I just remember telling, dude, I'm mad hype because I think it's, I, I still stand on this, is that I told Atlas that he's going to arenas, and I have said this for years. Oh, and, he is. And I have, like, you know what I mean? I'm mad stoked. So wherever that first arena show Atlas is. We're going. I'm out. Dude. Yeah, we're there. I'm <laughs> Sign I'm, in the front row. But like we talked about before about when you're building relationships with people and how you how you handle things differently when you're older. Like, I didn't want to rush sending him a song. I had songs that I could have sent him a few years before that, but it didn't feel right. And I had been in situations before where I've worked with artists where you just, you're so excited to get a song done with them that you send them the first thing you make. Like, but it's not their sound. Like, I wanted to make sure that even regardless of who it is, like, that I work now, no matter if they're huge or not, I want to make sure if they're on the song, it's because I believe that they're going to benefit from being on the song and it's going to make the song better, not because of what their name is or what their numbers are. Yeah. It's about making great music. And I think a lot of people, like, lose that because of, like, just seeing people's numbers and not really trying to make the best record possible. Like, when I'm on a song with someone, my first goal isn't, like, I want to out-rap you. It's like, you did this in the song. What can I do to bring the song to the next level or add the extra sauce that you didn't that you didn't do on it? Yeah, and I think timing is everything, too. Like, timing is everything. Yeah, I think it's important to, like, you know, know when to make a play or when to move and when to drop a song. And Yeah. Because I think if you just rush things and, like, you know, it could just not be what yeah. it could have been. I've had two situations like that. You have one where it's like you sit on a song for a long time because you believe in it, and you have the situations where you sit on a song for two years because you believe in it, and then you're in a completely different point. Like, you've, you've we've yeah. had this discussion, and you're like, this doesn't, I'm not angry anymore. This doesn't hit the same. Like, I don't want to talk about this anymore. So it's like a, a, a two sides to it in terms of like— Your mentality changes. Yeah, exactly. And sonically, you could have changed too. Of like, course. If you're not evolving, you're— you ain't gonna last in this industry. Yeah. What do you have to say about adapting in music? I mean, bro, like, my career-wise, I started off as a flippity-hibbity, like, logic, like, ra like rapper. Like, all I did was, all I did was, like, mostly fast rap type stuff or sound like, or try to sound like NF. I think when you first start making music, you're always gonna be compared to a few different artists because they're who inspire you and you're still molding yourself as a writer. Then the more comfortable you get writing 
is how you really take your music to the next level and find your sound. Like, I think the writing is honestly the most important part of finding, because you find your range and your voice and what you're able to do through the writing. Because you can write great, but if it's not in your vocal range, you know what I mean? It's not going to, I don't know. You got to push yourself, though. You got to push yourself as a writer. Like, I wrote every single day for years straight, and I still write every single day, whether it's writing down a few different ideas. There's never a point in any day where I'm not, like, at least thinking or brainstorming of some sort of inspiration. Yeah, I want to talk to you about inspiration, but inspiration outside of music. I want to talk to you about My Hero. Yes. That was the video that we did together. Yeah. So can we, I want to talk about, you know, creating that song and yeah. that video too. Yeah, so that was a tough one. So like a few years ago, it's actually going to be two years on St. Patrick's Day. The holidays fucked me for the rest of my life. It's always going to remind me of that. But my grandfather passed away. So he was my absolute like best friend. I, I, my parents got divorced when I was young. I would live at my dad's house and my mom's house 50-50, which my dad was at my grandparents at the time. So my hope from fourth grade on throughout all of high school, I was with him like every day. You know what I mean? Whether it was him being at all my games or me and him going bowling four times a week or just on the phone every single day talking. And I remember he had gotten sick and we didn't know what it was because my grandfather was the craziest dude in the freaking world. Like, 85 years old, doing 100 push-ups a day, running five miles, like, in the back of the yard, cutting trees. Like, this dude was built different. And I looked at him as immortal. My whole family did. When when someone's, like, that old and they're in that good of shape, you're like, nothing's ever going to happen to you. You've never even had, you've never even thrown up. Like, this dude, like, was, like, in the best shape. And he started, like, not feeling good at all. And, sorry, I'm rambling. No, you're good. And, no, I'm listening, dude. And he didn't feel good and went to the doctors and they were like, you have diabetes. And he's like, this makes no sense. Like, it doesn't make any sense. And he kept t- saying to his doctor, like, this doesn't, this doesn't feel good. Like, something doesn't feel right. And they got tests done and stuff. And they waited a long time to do it. And they found out, like, he had, like, stage four pancreatic cancer, like, done. Like, zero chance, I said, of, like, survival. And I remember just, it was right before I had went on my Ireland trip. Like, right before that that um, he had passed away and he was the one that like wanted me to go on that trip. So I made sure I had to go on that trip for him and I wanted to do a song that was dedicated to him and I wrote it before the trip and it was like the toughest song I ever had to write in my life. Like worst day ever. Still super like a the most traumatic moment of my life seeing someone that you love like die right in front of you. I remember being there like the like a couple hours before he passed away when he couldn't even like talk. And it's crazy to see someone like that you, that's like your hero And someone that you thought was immortal, like, just be, like, broken down in front of you. And he didn't know how to cope with that. Like, he, we, we had, like, the talk, a couple talks about, um, don't worry, I'm not crying, I just said this. Um, We had a few talks about just, like, how grateful I am, like, you're the best grandson ever, like, I love you, Grandpa. But it all happened so fast, it was crazy. Like, I don't even understand how it was humanly possible for someone to just be super, like, fine, and then three weeks later, like, you can't even walk or talk or, or eat. So we never had the final moment to just, like, really reflect on all of our memories and stuff. That never sat with me and that eats me alive, like, all the time. So, like, writing that song was really my way to say, like, I'm, like, thankful for everything you've done for me and all that stuff. So, yeah. What's some advice that your grandfather gave you that you carry with you? Um... Most of it I probably can't say because I'll get canceled. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but but um, he he true like as as corny as it is like he would truly he truly just said believe in yourself. Like he he was my number one supporter. He would go to he would write down on there. Forget it. I still have it. In, I always kept it in my wallet, which got fucking stolen, and I'm so pissed. But I had a note that he wrote that said uh, tube you. Spotify and it was like Apple Apple Music all spelt wrong and he would carry cards in his phone. And I didn't he, even know what you were saying. Until, yes. It just took me it a second to click. All spelt wrong like YouTube backwards and all he was so bad at spelling and would go to like all the restaurants nearby and every place he went to every person he met he'd be like you need to check out my grandson. You need to you need to check out his music. He was that dude like he was my absolute number one supporter and what was his nickname? The Dropper. He was a crazy fisherman, crazy bastard. He was fishing from the time, like, friggin' from 19, whatever it was, 40 to friggin' when he passed away. And all, he, like, invented this rig that they, like, he sold, and it was crazy. I don't even know if people are selling it now, because he used to leave it where this marina he worked at, and it was like a dropper rig, it was called, and that became his, that became his nickname for all his friends, and that's why I got the dropper tatted on me. 
um, me and him would always go to like, I wasn't the biggest fisherman. He, him and my dad are huge, huge into fishing, but he, um, would take me like once a year, we'd go to Maine and, and go fishing. And there was always this place, Lake Umbagog that we loved. And I, I'm starting like a tradition, like to go back there with my dad and always like do something like drop something in the water for him or. Yeah. Or do something. But that song was was tough to write, dude. It was very emotional. And uh, I can't listen to it, but the it, I know the video helped a lot of people. And that day we shot that was just crazy. crazy. Dude, I want to talk it, about the video next, dude. Sorry I'm rambling. No, you're not rambling. <laughs> it's bro, traumatic, we're, okay? <laughs> we're on a podcast. We're here to talk. I know. I just think I lose focus. <laughs> no, I you're, feel bad. No, I feel you're super focused, dude. But right. I want to talk to you about the music video now because... That was kind of a crazy day, dude. Like the weather, like the way everything happened. And yeah. just for people that may not know, you guys should go watch My Hero on YouTube. But yeah, the, all those locations are places where you're- Super, super personal locations. I wanted to make sure that when we did the video, also shout out to Mike because he did this on like 24 hour freaking notice. I drove to Connecticut, picked him up. We drove to Narragansett. So my grandfather had a beach house. Um in Wakefield, Narragansett area. And I knew that was really the setting that I wanted to shoot the video around, all around those areas. One, because we had a lot of memories around there as a kid. And two, because I know that was the place where he was the happiest, being by the water. And that was his that was his favorite place to be in the world. We went to the bowling alleys me and him used to go to. We went, we obviously, we shot at the house. We went through all these pictures. You see, we had so many freaking pictures together, like throughout my whole entire life. And the soccer fields and... There's a lot, but the craziest was when we were the on dock. The, yeah, the dock, and I'm, when we were on that water. Yeah, dude, like both of those. Like, so it just started pouring out, like completely, and like the emotions were crazy. And I was probably crying during the whole video, but you couldn't even tell because the water was coming down so fast in the rain. But in the chorus, when I say like when the wind starts to hit me, a gust of wind just came crazy, and like it was like. Phew, almost knocked me back and you just see my hands out and the wind just blowing and me and Mike just looked at each other and we were like if that wasn't like him there that day I don't know what I don't know what else it could have been bro. I think if you listen to the raw audio of that because you I cut out yeah. all the audio for the music video yeah. but I think if you listen to the raw audio you just hear me go oh holy, holy yeah. fuck <laughs> it, like faith is something that I feel like I struggled with after he passed away because it made me bitter towards just like religion or like, how could you, like, how could you do this to me? Like, how could you take the person that I love? Cause it hurt me so bad that it, it made me like, just look at life differently. And I think, um, I forget where I was going with that. We're talking about faith. Yeah. Struggling. With, I, I just, I lost it. Yeah, no, you're good. But another moment <laughs> I think about too, from that video was the doc too. The weather was so crazy that day like bro <laughs> if you go look it was just raining throughout the whole video but i think it like it added that like dr that effect and you really felt the pain yeah and just like what this like the song represented and stuff it just it was a cold day dude because we talk about we're like in march yeah. right yeah, yeah like march, march. Ra march cold rainy march yeah. day dude i remember <laughs> just going into like the car like warming up our hands in between we shoot yeah we shoot a take and like have a towel in the car and start like drying off but man that dude that dude was a legend. I I will forever be grateful for for him and everything he did for me and everything he continues to do for me. It sucks that trauma and traumatic events make you see life differently. But I don't think I think I have to believe that everything happens for a reason because otherwise you'll crawl up into a ball and cry. And I don't think I would be where I'm at musically today if that didn't happen because it was a real slap in the face when you see someone who you think is immortal and that will live forever pass away right in front of you and you're like Holy shit, I know we, me and you talk and we text our friends and we say time, like, don't take time for granted. Don't take this life for granted. But when something like that happens to you, it really makes you like, be like, I need to do whatever makes me happy now in this life. And that I would say truly, Mike, I know we talked about this before, but that was probably the moment where I sat down, I looked myself in the mirror and I said, like, I'm never doing anything different than music. That this is what I love. I know it would make my grandfather happy. I know, I know this is what I'm going to do because I'm going to do it for me. I'm going to do it for him and for everyone that I've lost and everyone that loves me. And that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, dude. And was your grandfather very supportive of your music? The most, man. Outside of just freaking going to the stores and telling everyone, like, I was, I was his number one. Like, it was just, um, he, every, anything I did, he believed in me to the full extent. A memory that I have with him that's so funny is that my, my senior year of soccer, like, 
don't get me wrong. I still I still played good in high school, but I didn't play up to what I thought I could have and what I did my whole life. And I, I was having a really bad game, and I ended up bouncing back. But I was having a terrible game, and this kid on my team's dad was like, get that captain off the field, blah, blah, blah. And I just remember being in the parking lot and hearing everyone screaming. And it's like, what's going on? And my dad's like, your grandfather's swinging at blah, blah, blah's dad. You got to go get him. I'm like, Graham, calm down. He's like, no one talks about my fucking grandson. I'll fucking kill you. <laughs> I'm like, Graham, it's okay. Like, let him be. He's like trying to choke him. He's like, I'm 82 years old and I'll still kick your ass. He was like, just fucking crazy. Like, if someone said anything about me, he was like, I'm punching this dude in the face. Yeah. And dude. a lot of the shit, like my no filter and everything I do and just the way I act is from him he was just full of life you can see it in the video like we we added clips of me and him dancing the dude the dude would literally freaking play frank sinatra so freaking loud the whole neighborhood could hear when he was just washing his car he would just leave the car on all day and just blast music i'm like bro you're so embarrassing and every freaking restaurant and place that we went to he had to embarrass me yeah which is a dude. tradition that i will carry on with all of my kids someday and everyone else that's amazing, dude. Yeah. No, <laughs> Hit on every waiter possible. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, you know, it's just part of life, dude. Part of life is losing. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's the inevitable. Yeah. Everyone's going to go through it. If they, if you haven't already. Or, Prepare yourself for it because you cannot deny it. Like, people don't live forever, and that's why you need to treat them as if every day is last. Tell the people that you love that you love them and make the most of every freaking day. Yeah. And you really got to appreciate people. While they're here, you yeah. know, and I know you hear everybody say that all yeah. the time, but it's so true. Like, listen, if someone's listening to this after this pod, call them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whoever I don't that care is if they for piss you. you off and then you're in some petty fight. Text them and say, I, I forgive you. I love you. Or say sorry if you fuck someone over because life is too short. I've had so many friendships and other things that people, uh, you know what I mean, bro? People pass away like the, in a blink of an eye. Just, yeah. And then the worst thing you want, like, is to, yeah, leave not, on a sour note. Yeah, it doesn't get worse than that. No, so, no. and especially for your own health, you know, and like mental health and like just finding peace within yourself. Yeah, you know? I learned to let go of a lot of burn bridges and just it's not worth ruining your own mental health and being stressed about things that you just you just have to learn to let go. Yeah, control what, what you can control. What's Elijah Kyle's message to the world? Be a good freaking person, and honestly, bro, truly find something that you're passionate with. And try to find a way to make money off it. And surround yourself with people who want to see you win. And also, yeah, just be a good freaking person, bro. <laughs> it's so important to be a good like, person. I think it's an I underrated think, skill. I think, about, I think about so many different ways to answer that question. And I and I, so many things pop into my head and I overthink it. But I truly th I believe in karma. I believe in just being a good human. But I don't believe in being a perfect human. I think it's okay to have bad days. We all go through some things. We all snap at people. But it's about when the chips really fall down, be there for the people that who are there for you and do what you can to make this world a better place than what you were brought into it as. No, I agree, dude. I think that was very well said. You know what I mean? I think a lot of us, we go through situations and it makes a lot of people bitter and, or like you blame what you went through growing up as an excuse to be an ass. And I, I think a lot of people, a lot of people do that, even that I know. And it's just, it's not worth it. Like... You can't be miserable, man. You can't succumb Th to those bad days. Think about how many people we talk, like, we see that are just miserable. Like, life is too short. Yeah. Just be a good person. And life is just going to keep giving you reasons yeah. to be jaded, so Just don't. keep, yeah. 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 Yeah, dude. So what's next for Elijah? I'm dropping weekly music this whole entire year. Let's go, Balls dude. to the freaking wall. And I'm not sacrificing quality. You know what I mean? Like, you get a lot of comments when you're dropping weekly, like, bro, how are you going to do this? Like, I'm switching up the genre every week. I've been prepared. I got this shit. I'm excited content every single day just trying to grow my social media i'm trying to tour i'm trying to sell new merch and i'm trying to live i'm trying to live as much as possible and keep growing as a person because even like hearing myself speak now to back then i'm i am such a diff in a different mind state than where i used to be and it's just crazy to think it's crazy to think back to how it was to where i am today and just being able to be confident enough to be here and sit down with you and be in a mental space where I feel genuinely happy for the first time in so long. And it's it's great to feel. And I do think happiness is a choice. I really do. Yeah, and I think people underestimate how hard it is. Like, listen. It is fucking hard, man. What, yeah, but I was going to say to even just come on a podcast and talk to you an hour because, dog, if you're not truly yourself and yeah. like. A per, like, I mean, bro, and I I got crazy ADD. Like, I, and my my problem is like, I, it's tough for me to focus, dog. Like, I, I, I say things and I'm like, oh, no, what did I just say? Oh, no. Oh, shit. 
throw the uh, you know what I mean? You just yeah. gotta let go. Just just fucking be yourself, man. <laughs> yeah, and if people want to connect with you, how can they? Social media. I, I'm very good at responding to to everything, pretty much. Like I. If I'm generally not responding to a text or a DM, it's because I'm generally busy that week. I do my best to every day go through my go through my DMs and comment back to my fans on posts because that's what got me here today. You know what I mean? I build a community. I have like group chats on Instagram, the broadcast channel, and I have a group chat on Twitter where I, I still have the same group chat with the same my first ten fans on Twitter that from twenty seventeen and they're still here in a group chat today. Oh, the EK dude. Fam Council, and I, I thought about adding new members, and we always did, but like this is the core ten that stuck with me, and it's, it's dope, and it's crazy because a few of them turn into some of my like actually best friends. Oh, amazing! Who dude. I play FIFA with all the time, and freaking I'm always talking to. Yeah, dude, and like, is your at the same on all platforms? Yeah, it used to not be, but luckily I changed that. It's all at Elijah Kyle Music. The only thing that's different is Facebook is Elijah Kyle official, mm. but at Elijah Kyle Music for every single platform. Well, Elijah, I want to thank you for coming on the Mike Squires and Friends podcast, dude. Thank you for having me on, brother. I love you, man. Thank you for love all you, you do. too, dude. Good episode. A lot of fun. I think a lot of people will take away, probably like not even so much music stuff from this episode. They might take away just like life stuff. And that's, and I want to say before I leave that that is my biggest goal. Out Like as much as I love music and I want to be successful, I always say like if that's the only thing that I'm known for, then I failed because I want to be known for so many different things. And if even if it's just inspiring or making someone's days better, making someone days better, day better, brr, <laughs> then I'm happy. You know what I mean? There's so much more to life than music, and yeah. Let's go, dude. I appreciate you coming on, dude. Thanks, bro. Woo! I want to share with you guys my thought of the day, and my thought of the day is this. There's going to be a lot of tough days, but it's how you bounce back from those days that make it count. Life's not always going to be easy, and that's okay. You can't enjoy the sun without a little rain. And remember, you have to believe before the world does.